Well, good morning, SRPC. It is so good to have you here this morning in person, in church, and a special welcome to those of you who are watching on SRPC live stream, wherever you are. We hope that you'll enjoy the service today. We are in a series that leads us all the way up to Easter called Crossroads. We're taking a look at the road Jesus took all the way to Jerusalem and eventually to the cross. And we're stopping along the way to listen to Jesus teach and to watch him interact with people. Today, we're gonna be talking about one of the parables that Jesus taught on his way to Jerusalem. Now, if you're like me, you might think, well, parables are nice little stories with a point. And yeah, that's true, but the point of almost every parable ought to make us squirm. In fact, if parables don't make you squirm, you're actually not listening very well. So today we're gonna talk about a a parable that causes us to squirm and the center of our squeamishness, surprisingly, is grace. It's a parable about the kingdom of God and what it's gonna be like. So as we start worship today, I'd like to invite you to stand with me and we are going to uh, sing uh, a, a version of the Lord's Prayer, which has in it that wonderful line, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Would you stand? Let me pray for us, and then let's worship. God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your life among us and your work within us. We pray that we would have the courage and the faith to allow you to have your way with us, whatever that looks like. Lord, if you want to disrupt us this morning, we ask that we would have the faith and courage to allow you to do that until your kingdom comes and your will is done on earth as it is in heaven. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's worship.
that I just love. And it always gets to me when it says, Lord, prone to wander. Lord, I feel it. Do you feel that this morning? Your need for him to come and to show you his grace and mercy. chapter 1. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you, 
who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. In all this, you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. These have come so that the proven genuineness of your faith of greater worth than gold, which perishes though refined by fire, may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Though now you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. For you are receiving the end result of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Therefore, with minds that are alert and fully sober, set your hope on the grace to be brought to you. When Jesus Christ is revealed at his coming, as obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. But just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all that you do. For it is written, be holy because I am holy. Christ. 
Lord Jesus, we come before you this morning because you are that living hope. Thank you, Lord, that you give us voices to sing. Thank you, Jesus, that you are present here. Lord, we live in such interesting times, God. Father, a, a friend of mine who was a missionary in Ukraine, now stateside again, but has had connections with people over there, Lord, and he sent me a prayer, a prayer that was written by someone on the ground in the conflict. And sometimes, Lord, it's, it can be a powerful thing to hear a prayer for someone in the most difficult of situations that can become our prayer too. We think of in the spirit of David in the Psalms. We think of missionaries and others who've been through profound times whose prayers have encouraged us or spoken for us. So Lord God, I wanna come alongside this prayer today. Lord, hear us as we pray and may this be our prayer as well. Hear this prayer. I can't ask for the unbelieving, but from the flames of the great trial, purify those who are your children. So much that we tolerated for so long comes to the surface of us now. Forgive us for the unresolved sins that we must now deal with. May this horror give us courage to stop covering sins. Give us grace to reckon with them. Give us a stern resolve to deal with sin. Give us repentance and forgiveness. Give us a love that upholds your holiness. We feel trapped in the machinations of politics. Show us where to turn with our anger so we are not destroyed by it, so we don't become the enemy. Show us how we are free in you. Show us the multitude of ways your love expresses itself in these circumstances. God, the insane and relentless bombing, Please come to our aid directly by stopping it somehow or by stopping Putin directly. Or raise up aid for us from among people as is your usual way in this time. Give extreme accuracy to the anti-missile machines. Silence the artillery. God, I ask this, not because we deserve your mercy and help, but you love mercy, God, so we ask you for it and help us to ask for mercy for those who seem unworthy. For truly, that is who we are too. Give us an end, a good end today. Lord, we pray with Anne and her family who's offered this prayer. Father, we too know that we stand in need of mercy. We too are those who cry out for justice. We thank you, Lord, that you are a living hope. We ask this in your name, Jesus, amen. I invite you to have a seat as we continue in worship. My name is Mike, I'm one of the pastors here, and uh, thank you for being with us. Uh, thank you to those of you who are online, special welcome to you too. Wherever you are that you get to join us through video, um, we're so glad for you as well. When we gather here, we are a testimony, we are a proclamation of the living hope of Jesus Christ of his love, of the prevalence of Jesus in his church. So thank you. You are a testimony to the world just by your gathering here and being part of this. This is a time where we're, we are reminded of the greater church, the bigger church that we're a part of. And in fact, in just about a week, we're gonna participate in a way that's gonna remind us of that even more because in our uh, spring break time, at least for a number of our students, we have our annual mission trip or outreach experience. And I'd like to invite up Julie Keene, who is our director of student ministries. Good morning, Julie. <laughs> Julie's been uh, championing this ministry for a number of years now, and uh, we are only one week away from the spring break mission experience. And we just thought this would be a great opportunity to share with you a little bit of what that's going to look like this year. So we'd love to hear about that, Julie. Yeah, as, as you guys know, some of you, we've been um, partnering with some churches in Fremont to reach out to all of the Afghans that are coming into the area. The largest population of Afghans outside of Afghanistan is apparently in Fremont, um, outside of Kabul. So um, 
So we are going, there's a small group of us going to go over there as part of a grassroots effort to reach out to 5,000 Afghan families that they've interacted with and collected a list of over this time period. And um, so they're putting together 60,000 Easter eggs across all these different churches. Our junior hires put together almost 2,000 of them, which was a super fun time last Wednesday. Um, and now our high schoolers are going to get to go and, and serve. So um, we're going to be going door to door and dropping off these bags with an invitation on behalf of the Afghan Christian Church in, in Fremont, um, which is going to be just, I don't, we're so excited. That is awesome. And an extension of some ministry we've been doing with the Afghan community already through the kitchen kits that we uh, purchased in the fall as well. Yeah. Well, Julie, we here, sitting here, some of us don't attend the youth group meetings on a regular basis. How can we be a part of this outreach in some way? Yeah, so there's three ways um, if you'd like to join with us. Um, the first is just to continue to give financially online. Our costs are just our food and our gas. And so everything over and above that um, will be given directly to outreach ministry um, to Afghans, which is just really cool. It's great to be able to know that we're just going and serving very openly. Um, on top of that, prayer, um, covering us in prayer throughout the week. And if you'd like to be praying for us, you can um, send me an email or let me know. I would love to send you guys an email and just with specific things you could be praying for for our group. And then finally, the last one, which is kind of unique for this year, because we're local and because we're a smaller group, we would love if there's anybody who would like to join us for a day. Um, you can come for a day or two over the week of spring break. Um, we'll meet at the church in the morning and go wherever we're going, um, go out to eat at an ethnic restaurant for lunch, which will be a fun experience, and then come back sometime in the later afternoon or evening. So That is yeah. awesome. Wow, what an opportunity. Well, thank you so much, Julie. Appreciate what you're doing. We'll be praying for that week. And uh, you can talk to Julie after the service if you're interested or email her at julie at srpc.org. And uh, yeah. Looking forward to seeing how God's gonna move through that in the greater church. Hey, our church grew by one staff member this past month. And we, yeah, we're pretty, it's, as some of you may know, we've been praying for a while and looking for someone to fill an administrator role in our office, and God answered that prayer. And she's here with us this morning. I'd like to introduce Melody Froelich. And Melody, if you could just stand up so we could see you. She's in the yellow there. Yep, I love it. And uh, Melody is here, and is your daughter here today? Is she in the Sunday school? Okay, so her daughter you might meet too is Autumn. And Melody, we're just so grateful that you guys are with us, and we just pray this will be a blessing for you, as I know we'll be blessed through you, as we already have in the office. So after church today, you might get an opportunity uh, to visit with Melody and, and Autumn as well. Well, we do come to that time and we recognize our tithes and offerings here. And You know, in the old days, we would just pass a basket and now many of you give online or and some of you really don't want a basket from somebody else <laughs> handed to you. And so, uh, but we still want to take this time to stop and worship and to pause, to thank God for the gifts he gives us and that he, uh, through these offerings, sustains us as a church and also allows us to bless many others through that. So we want to continue to recognize and give thanks Thank you to the many of you who give so faithfully in the many ways that you do. If you do bring something, we always have a box there, but I know many of you, again, are electronic or send things in uh, that kind of way. You know, um, there are times of the year where we kind of rally, and maybe it's at the holidays and, and those special times, and those are great, um, but I want to just say a special thanks to those who give throughout the year, or maybe just as God prompts your heart, and it could be just a random week. We're actually in the process right now where every spring we prepare a budget for the next year, we start looking ahead. So one of the things we look at is how are we doing now, not like way back here. So this is an important time. Do we have the affirmation of the congregation that financially as well as otherwise, yeah, keep going, keep moving forward. So just as you pray and think about those things, this is what happens throughout the year. So let me just give a word of thanks for uh, what God is doing in and through that and then Pastor Mark's gonna come share with us. Heavenly Father, um, we are so grateful for how you have moved in lives through this congregation. We thank you, Lord, for our student ministries. Thank you for Julie and her team who so faithfully served. God, we pray it would just be an awesome week coming up for them. Father, we pray for those who will come alongside, Father, and, and some will get an opportunity to participate, go eat some great food, and also share with others as we be hands and feet in your kingdom. We pray for those who will come alongside in prayer and even financial gifts. Father, we um, pray for Melody as she begins this journey with us. 
Lord, that this would just be a rich experience for her, Lord God, and that, Father, we too would grow with her as we walk in this faith step. And Lord, we thank you for just the various gifts that you have poured out into this congregation. We pray, Father, that there would be an affirmation of your work here financially as it has been, as well as the many other gifts that we see and change lives in the congregation. And Father, now I pray for Pastor Mark. Lord, I pray he would just be overflowing with your spirit this morning. And I pray, Father, we would catch that in our own hearts. We would leave here differently than we came because we heard you, we experienced you here today. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, our living hope. Amen. Amen. Hi, Mike. Morning, brother. How are you? I'm doing well. How well, are you? I'm doing all right. Good. Hey, Looking thanks so much for that prayer you shared. And I'm wondering if there's a way to get a copy of that. that no. We could maybe, no. No, that's no it. way. We okay. cannot. Okay. All, right, all right. I would love to. Yeah, if you are interested, just let me know, and uh, I'd be happy to run That'd be off. terrific. Yeah. It was so, so powerful. So thank you for, for sharing that. Great. Well, good morning, everyone, and good morning again to those of you on SRPC live stream. We're glad that you're with us. We are continuing a series that we began several weeks ago called Crossroads. We're following Jesus to Jerusalem and then to the cross. Now, along with the series, there is a handout that you receive in person each week or online in our Saturday update. If you don't have that with you, just slip your hand up, and uh, we'll make sure, uh, Doug, we'll make sure that you uh, get one, or Dave, and so we'd love to have you track with us uh, because there's some important things in, in that. And in fact, I wanna mention specifically the season of Lent that we're in. It's the 40 days that lead up to Easter. This is such an important season because it offers us the opportunity to deepen our relationship with Jesus. Now oftentimes when we think of deepening our relationship, we think of studying more, of learning more, and that's part of deepening, but a large part of deepening is allowing God to, to move his love and his life and his spirit from our heads into our hearts. And, and so what we're doing along this journey is we're giving you tools, we're giving you resources to help you do that. One of the resources that we offer is this weekly handout because it has some, some uh, tools in there we call spiritual practices that help you move along in deepening your journey with Jesus. One of them is uh, conversations that you can engage in with God from week to week based on some of the things we talk about on Sunday mornings. There's another spiritual practice that just uh, reminds you to look back at your day at the end of your day to look for God's grace and God's work in your life. Another spiritual practice is just to spend time in God's word and ask God to speak specifically to you through his word. And so these are ways that we can deepen our relationship with Jesus. If you use these tools, I think you'll learn to love Jesus and people more deeply. So that's what this is about, and we don't want you to miss that opportunity week to week as we journey with Jesus to Jerusalem and then the cross. Let me pray for us, and then we'll jump in. Lord, this morning I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts would be pleasing to you. Thank you that you're our rock. Thank you that you are our redeemer. We offer this time and our very selves to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Often on Sunday mornings, I will start the outline and start the message with the big idea. It's sort of the one thing I, I would like you to keep in mind and go away from uh, the service with more than anything else. This morning, I'm not doing that. I'm starting with the big question. And this question is so important, so central to what we're gonna talk about today. I really want it to stick with us through the entire message. Here's the question. How disruptive will I allow Jesus to be with me? It's a scary question. How disruptive will I allow Jesus to be with me and with my life? Here's the thing, Jesus, and we'll see this in our passage this morning, is on the road to the cross, and he is clear with us that that road involves self-denial. He's clear with us that that road involves taking up your cross. He's clear with us in telling us that if we try to pursue life, we'll lose it. 
Only when we lose our lives will we find it. That's the kind of crystal clarity that Jesus is offering, is sharing with his disciples and with you and me as he's on the road to the cross. Now, I don't know about you, but I look at things like self-denial, taking up my cross, losing myself, and I don't like that. That doesn't sit well with me. In fact, I do a very little journaling in my life, but I've been doing a little more we'll put it that way, during this season. And a couple of weeks ago as I was reading through the scriptures and just asking God to speak to me personally, I started journaling and, and my journal, I just try to be as honest as I can with who I am in my journal and I said, God, do I even want this? I mean, really, do I even want this? To, to deny myself, to, to take up a cross, to lose myself, do, do I even want it? Or is it just a church thing that I know I'm supposed to be a part of? And so I'm asking God to to help me want it. And that's disruption. And that's what God wants in our lives. And and I don't like it, and and I hope this morning, as I said at the outset, that by the time we're done, you're gonna squirm a bit. (laughs) Because it is not comfortable stuff. So, This is a parable that Jesus taught about the kingdom of God. But I want to give you the context. We'll be in Matthew chapter 20. Let me give you the context. This parable comes right on the heels of Jesus' conversation with the rich young ruler. Now, many of us know that story. Rich young guy comes to Jesus and says, look it, I want eternal life. What do I have to do to get it? Jesus says, well, how about a few of the commandments? And he rattles off the commandments, and the guy says, I've checked all those boxes. Jesus says to him, well, how about this? What if you sell everything and come and follow me? (laughs) And the guy goes, yeah, not going there. And he walks away. Big moment. The disciples, when they hear this, they are rattled to the core. They're wrecked. And they say to Jesus, okay, (laughs) if that's the deal, who is gonna be saved? It's at that point where Jesus says this, with God, all things are possible. With God, all things are possible. So the disciples had this sense of angst, and Jesus says, you know what, it's possible because of God. Now, Peter, he is, cl- I'm gonna do a sermon series on Peter. I, I decided that this week. And my, my title for my sermon series is this, I said that out loud. <laughs> <laughs> Because he's always doing this stuff that you're just like, come on, dude. So here's what Peter says. He speaks up. He goes, hey, 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 what about us? We've left everything. What are we going to get? What a dumb question. So Jesus says, look at There are huge rewards coming for those of you who followed me. But he says, I want to remind you that the f- some, many, in fact, who are first, they're going to be last. And many who are last, they're going to be first. Now that encounter with this rich young ruler and with his disciples sets up this whole parable. All right, we've got to know that. Now let me read the parable. Matthew chapter 20, starting with verse 1. Let me get there. Okay. I'm going to get there. Here's what Jesus says. For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire workers for his vineyard. He agreed to pay them a denarius for the day and sent them into his vineyard. About nine in the morning, he went out and saw others standing in the marketplace doing nothing. And he told them, you also go work in my vineyard and I'll pay you whatever is right. So they went. He went out again about noon and about three in the afternoon and did the same thing. About five in the afternoon, he went out and found still others standing around. He asked them, why have you been standing here all day doing nothing? Because no one's hired us, they answered. He said to them, you also go and work in my vineyard. When evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, call the workers in and pay them their wages, beginning with the last ones hired and going all the way to the first. Well, the workers who were hired about five in the afternoon came and each received a denarius. So when those who came, came who were hired first, they expected to receive more. 
but each one of them also received a denarius. When they received it, they began to grumble against the landowner. Those who were hired last worked only one hour, they said, and, and you've made them equal with us who've borne the burden of the work and the heat of the day. But he answered one of them, I'm not being unfair to you, friend. Didn't you agree to work for a denarius? Take your pay and go. I want to give the one who was hired last the same as I gave you. Don't I have the right to do what I want with my own money? Or are you envious because I'm generous? So, the last will be first and the first will be last. Squirming yet? We'll get there, trust me. Right from the start, this parable is laser focused on the landowner. It is the landowner who is the central figure in this parable. It's all about the landowner. And in Jesus' parables, the central figure, more often than not, represents God. So here's how Jesus begins. The kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire workers for his vineyard. He agreed, he agreed to pay them a denarius for the day and sent them into the vineyard. We get crystal clear right from the beginning from the mouth of Jesus that this is all about the landowner. It's his vineyard. He's the one that does the hiring. He's the one that has the resources. He's the one that makes the decisions. And these early morning workers are hired under an agreement for pay. And the agreement is a denarius for the day. Now, back in Jesus' day, a denarius was a quantity of money that was equivalent to about a day's pay. So, he agreed and they agreed that they would be paid a day's pay for a day's work. Now, there's an old adage that, that many of you probably heard and learned growing up. I know I certainly did, especially before my first job. Let me see if you can complete this sentence. It goes like this. An honest day's work for what? An honest day's wages. An honest day's work for an honest day's wage. That's what they agreed to those early morning workers. Now, as we move on, we get more insight about the landowner. Remember, it's all about the landowner. Check it out, verses three and four. About nine in the morning, he went out again and saw others standing in the marketplace doing nothing. And he told them, you also go and work in my vineyard, and I will pay you whatever is right. So they went. Notice what he says to these nine o'clock in the morning workers. He says, I will pay you whatever is right. Okay? The nine o'clock workers have to trust the integrity of the landowner. They have to trust that he will do right by them. No promise of an amount. Just I'll pay you what's right. It goes on. He went out again about noon, and again about three in the afternoon, and again about five in the afternoon, and he went out and found still others. So the landowner continues to go out and he continues to gather workers all the way up to the very last hour of the day. He's hiring people. Now, for these late day workers, there is no mention of pay, nothing. They have to simply trust that the landowner is good. They have to trust the goodness of the landowner. Now, if you take a step back from this parable, you'll notice that we've got three levels of workers in this story, right? You've got the first workers, the, the all day workers who are working a contractual agreement. They cut a bargain with the landowner and they know what's coming to them. You've got the, the second level of workers, the people that came in at nine o'clock and noon, and they are the ones that have to trust that the landowner will do right by them. They have to trust his integrity. And then you've got the lasts, the very last workers, and their only hope for anything 
is the goodness of the landowner. What happens next is where the whole parable turns. It's payday. It's time to collect money. The landowner says to his foreman, go out and bring them all in because it's time to pay the workers. Oh, by the way, he says, start with the ones who were hired last. Bring them in first. And then eventually we'll get to the ones that I hired at the very beginning of the day. So here's how it goes, verses 9 and 10. The workers who were hired about 5 in the afternoon came in, and each received a denarius. So when those came who were hired first, they expected to receive more. But each one of them also received a denarius. At the end of the day, the character of the landowner is revealed. People know who this guy is at the end of the day, and here's who he is. He's a guy who keeps his word. He is a guy who does right by people, and he is a, he is a guy who demonstrates extraordinary generosity. That's what we learn about the landowner at the end of the day. Now, what should be an absolutely raucous celebration turns into a grumbling festival because of the all-day workers. Listen to them in verse 12. Those who were hired last, they, they complain. First of all, they complain to the landowner. And he says, listen, those who were hired last worked only one hour and you've made them equal to us who have borne the burden of the work and the heat of the day. The all-day workers compare themselves to the end of the day workers and begrudge, listen, they begrudge the generosity of the landowner. This is so important. This is so important. Their complaint was not that he was unfair. Their complaint was he was generous to people that they thought were undeserving. Did you catch that? They did not complain that he wasn't fair to them. They complained that he was generous to people that they deemed undeserving. Here's their words. You have made them equal to us. Now, that's where the parable turns, and that's where we see the challenge through the questions of the landowner, because you know what? The boss, you know this, the boss always has the last word, right? So, here's the last word of the boss, and it comes in the form of two questions. The first is this, don't I have the right to do what I want with my money? Second question, or are you envious because I'm generous? Now the first question, don't I have the right to do what I want with my money? That question is to remind them of who is in charge here. It's my money and I can do whatever I want with my money. This is about the sovereignty of God. Remember, the landowner is God. God is in charge, Jesus says. People are not. God is in charge. I am not. God is in charge. You are not. That first question reminds us of who the landowner is. The landowner is sovereign in his decision making. The second question, and this is where the twist comes, the second question is about sin. And it's specifically about the sin of the righteous. It's about the sin of the all day workers. Here's the question, remember it? Are you envious because I'm generous? You see, the sin of the righteous 
is they didn't recognize and celebrate the grace, the extravagant generosity that was given to the end of the day workers. That's the sin of the righteous. So Jesus wraps up the parable with this terse statement. So the last will be first and the first will be last. Here's what Jesus means. The last will be first because of sheer grace. It is the extravagant generosity of the landowner, the extravagant generosity of God that brings those who we deem undeserving into the kingdom. The last will be first. Ha, here's the second half. The first will be last. The first will be last not because they didn't do anything. They spent the whole day in the vineyard. The first will be last because of pride. Because pride blinded them to grace. In fact, they are so blind that they've been blinded to the grace that was given to them at the beginning of the day. Do you remember the story? It was the landowner that went out and found them. It was the landowner that said, come to my vineyard and work the day. It was the landowner who promised them a denarius, an honest day's work for an honest day wage. It was the landowner who kept his promise. It's all about the landowner and they are so blinded by pride they forgot the grace that happened at the beginning of the day when the landowner came out and found them. I began with a question and I want to ask it again because we're going to turn the corner and it gets hard. The question is this, how disruptive will I allow Jesus to be with me? I'm gonna close today with some disruptive truths that come right from this parable, from Jesus. So let's talk about the way Jesus disrupts our lives. First, judgment day will be full of surprises. Now, I don't know about you, but I think surprise and I think good. (laughs) In this case, mm, not a good surprise. Jesus makes it clear that there will be surprises on Judgment Day, and many of the surprises will be surprises to who? The all-day workers. They're the ones that are gonna be surprised at Judgment Day, and sadly, those surprises are rooted in pride. And those most likely to fall into the trap of pride are the ones who have worked all day. The people who've been working for God for a long, long time are most susceptible to pride. Do you know anyone like that? Hmm, I do. And it's me. Now, there's a way to protect yourself against those surprises. And this is the way, and this is where it gets hard. The the way to protect yourself against those surprises is to engage with the least and the lowly. To be part of God's gracious outreach to the least and the lowly. What does that look like? Well, it may look like going online on our SRPC website or in our Saturday email and finding out the name of someone at Shepherd's Gate, a child, who you can give an Easter basket to. And doing more than just filling that basket and bringing it back to church, but actually praying for that child and his or her mom by name. Not just now, but for a long time to come. Maybe it looks like joining Julie and the youth group and and spending a day down in Fremont or or Concord or one of the other areas where there are are, our new Afghan neighbors and going door to door and just offering a a gift and an invitation to an Afghan Christian church and and eating at at an ethnic restaurant at lunchtime and getting to know our kids and and getting to, to know people in the community who have very different backgrounds than us. Maybe it means mentoring some of our students in the school district who've been left behind because of COVID and and they're struggling to keep up or catch up and 
and you've got skills and you've got an ability and a subject matter and, and you could step into that role as a mentor. See, to engage with the least and the last and the lowly is the antidote to pride. Here's what I believe. I believe that when we do that, some of those that we engage with will respond to the grace and the generosity of Jesus. <laughs> and when they do, we get to celebrate. And, and if you're involved in any way, shape, or form in, in their lives, you get to join in that celebration. I mean, what could be better? Judgment Day will be a day of surprises. Second disruptive thought, truth by Jesus. Grace levels by lifting. I grew up in the church, and we had this wonderful phrase when I was a kid growing up in the church. It went like this. The ground at the cross is level. Isn't that great? How many have heard that saying before or something like it? The ground at the cross is level. And, and I wondered what that meant. Well, here, here's what it meant to, to me. That everyone is the same in God's eyes. That, that Jesus died for all of us, no matter who we are, that the ground at the cross is level. And listen, that is well and good. And it's true. But let's factor in this truth as well. That I grew up privileged. That most of us grew up privileged. I had a house I grew up in. I had clean water. I had a good education. I could find a job. I knew if I got in trouble, I'd be treated right. I, I grew up privileged. And I live a privileged life. And so here's the thing. Though everyone is the same in God's eyes, everyone is not the same in this world. And this parable is about a landowner who is so generous that he keeps going after people all the way to the end of the day. And he gives them the same as he gave the all-day workers. The way grace levels in this world, which is wrecked because of sin, is more often than not by lifting others up. There's a famous verse in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. A lot of us know it, and, and you'll at least have it ring a bell when, when I read it. It goes like this. If anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old has passed away. The new has come. How many recognize that verse? Yeah, it's a great verse. Can I read the next one? Here's the next one. All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. All this is from God, who reconciled us to Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Here's what that means. Jesus handed the ball off to us. And now that we are people in the business of the ministry of reconciliation, just like Jesus, our role is to lift people up to grace, to show the world God's grace, to make the ground level at the cross by lifting those who don't have privileged lives. That's a hard and disruptive truth. Here's the third. Sin is deceptive. This is especially true for all day workers. It's especially true for those of us who have faithfully served God. It's especially true for those of us who have served the church and served people in the name of Jesus. Sin is deceptive, especially for us. Listen. Nobody, nobody will be in the kingdom of God because of how long and how faithfully they served. Nobody will be in the kingdom of God because of how long and faithfully they served. The only reason 
is the sheer grace of God who came out and happened to find us at the beginning of the day. That's the only reason we're there. That's the only reason we stand a chance. It's not because how faithfully we've served. It's not because how much we've done. It's not because how much we've given. It's because the generous God reached out and found us at the beginning of the day. Some of us, I'll raise my hand first, need a wake-up call to that truth. You see, we forgot it was the grace of God that found us, and because of that, we can't see and celebrate the grace God is offering to others, especially those that we think don't deserve it, at least as much as we do. The only reason we'll be in the kingdom is the sheer grace of God. That's why the spiritual practices are so important And I want to call your attention to one of them today. It's, if you've got your hand out, it's the the second bullet. This is stuff that you can talk to God about today and tomorrow, this week. Ask the Lord to reveal to you ways you compare yourself to others, measuring how you stack up and how others don't. What does that look like for you with people inside the church? What does that look like for you with those outside the church? Spend some time with God in humble repentance, repenting of our pride. Because if we fail to see God's grace in our lives as the only reason we've got any kind of chance at all for the kingdom, we'll miss seeing it in others. And then, Invite God how to show you how to demonstrate the extravagant grace of Jesus to someone today. God has reconciled himself to us in Christ and called us to the ministry of reconciliation. How disruptive will you allow Jesus to be with you? We're going to close today by singing a song that we know because we sing it here. It's called Amazing Grace. But we're singing the version that has in the the middle of it this line, my chains are gone, I've been set free. Can I tell you something about chains? Some chains that bind us are deeper than surface level chains. They're soul strangling chains. They're chains of pride and works righteousness. They're chains of of comparison. They're chains of privilege. They're chains of being envious of God's generosity. And we need to be set free from those chains so that we can be free to receive God's grace in our lives again and remember it. So we can be free to remember God's grace in other people's lives and be a part of that grace giving so that we can lift people to the grace of God in Jesus. That's how disruptive Jesus wants to be with you and with me. Let's pray about that. Jesus, you don't pull punches. You confront us again and again in your word and by your life with disruptive truths. And you do that not to shake us up and to shame us, but you do that to open our eyes to your invitation of great and extravagant grace. You do that so we'll remember grace and our lives will be lived that way. Would you please, today, give us the courage to allow ourselves to be disrupted. 
We pray in Jesus' name and for our sake as followers. Amen. Stand with us and join us as we sing. While I think of it, would you just thank these two ladies that have joined us on the front here, Beth and Alyssa? If you don't know, Alyssa, she's been kind of new to us. sensed God moving this morning in some way and even just resting that last song. 
Um, I'm going to share a few highlights just as we always do at the end of the service or typically do and looking forward. I want to share one thing with you. Uh, some of you uh, may know if you were here from the very beginning of our church, a lady that was very much a part of our life here um, named Carol Farmer. Uh, many of you know her well. She um, recently went to, a, she's moved away because she was getting older and w- went down to Southern California to be with family and uh, was going into her 90s. Anyway, she was at a wedding, having a great time and all this, but she descended quickly after that. We just received news that she passed away on Monday. And uh, just want to let you know, some of you know her, she was a founding member of this church, active as a deacon, and if you ever saw her, you wouldn't forget her. Uh, she, was, she could be very direct and honest and sincere, and yet such a dear heart. And uh, just our prayers for her and the family. If you're interested, she is going to have, there's a couple of memorial services that are going to be in Southern California on Easter week. And uh, Jane Hatton, Beth Gibson are a couple people that have been connected with the family. You can find out more information or just contact the church office about that. But I know if Carol were here, she would not want me to keep going on about that. Move on with what God has in store for us. <laughs> and uh, we have, uh, as you leave here today, you'll see some empty Easter baskets that are waiting to be filled for some children at Shepherd's Gate and that ministry there. We'd love uh, for you to help with that. If you signed up for a basket, that basket's there. I believe, last I looked, we had about maybe three that hadn't been taken. So just talk to uh, Tina and Melody will be out there. So if you haven't signed up, there may still be an opportunity, but they've been going fast. Mm-hmm. And thank you for that. Don't forget to fill them up and bring them back in a couple weeks uh, so that we can deliver uh, those. That would be a great thing to do. Hey, also, Tuesday night, uh, Mark was talking about these uh, handouts that we've been doing here, and hopefully some of you have been using the exercises during the week to just rest in the Lord, to hear from him, to pray, and just some awesome things to do. Well, we're going to have a Tuesday night, have some soup to talk about how you've experienced that. So if you've walked through this, and the Wolfords have been graciously, uh, have graciously opened up their home to invite us over there, so you do need to sign up so we know you're coming, but it's a soup night at their house uh, Tuesday night, and we hope we'll get to see a number of you uh, for that as well. Well, last Sunday, we had a fun time out in the park. Yeah, you and, did. Uh, yeah, you I did. got to go too, which was fun. And yeah. here's some of the children enjoying that time, some more images from that. Thank you so much to our Madison and our Sunday school group who helped make those things happen. But for some of you who are wondering, wow, I wish I could have been there, there's an opportunity coming up. Mm-hmm. The Saturday before Easter, we're going to put on an event right here in our parking lot for not just our children, but any in the community who would like to come, do some Easter-type themes. It'll be from 1030 to noon, as you see there. We could use help, volunteers, people just loving these kids, and just make it a great time. So if it looked fun last Sunday, come and uh, help us love on our community Uh, in that way as well. Mm -hmm. And one announcement I know Carol would want me not to forget, (laughs) this is the last Sunday of the month, which means it's our Deacon's Fund collection. So every month we we collect some funds. This is an emergency fund to help people who have needs in our community or sometimes right here in our SRPC family. It's just a great way to bless folks and some of you here have been blessed through that. Mm -hmm. So as you leave today, you'll see some folks with some different kind of baskets, not quite as colorful as the Easter eggs, but Mm -hmm. very important. (laughs) All right, Pastor Mark. That's right, great. Thank you, Mike, and thanks for all that. There's a lot to engage in in the life of our church and even beyond, and so I I pray that uh, you'll take those opportunities to heart and and then move into those because I promise you when you do that, you'll get to see the grace of God, and then you'll celebrate that, and that is what it's all about. So this week, starting now, may you experience anew the extravagant generosity of God. Amen? Amen? Amen. God bless. We'll see you soon.